right. Well, it's good to be with you all this morning. So um, since we're just such a small group, we are going to be very informal. We will kind of go through restorative practices. This really is an overview as to what restorative practices are, where they came from, kind of the different components um, that are part of restorative practices. And then really, I want you all to just kind of be thinking through this morning and deciding, is this something that you feel like would be beneficial um, to your district or to a specific school in your district or your school individually? Um, and we'll answer some questions kind of towards the end as to what would be your next steps if this is something that you really feel like would benefit your district, your school. Um, and we can talk with Mary about that as well. So I want you all to know that this is for you all and for your understanding this morning. Um, if you have questions at any time, drop them in the chat. I know that Brana is on with us from KVEC as well as Mary, and they'll, I'm sure, be monitoring the chat and can stop me at any time. Um, but if anybody has any questions, feel free also to jump in and ask questions as we go throughout the morning. So we are going to get started with a little circle activity. So I don't know if everyone has camera ability or not. I know that Lisa already mentioned that her camera is not working this morning. If you do, it'd be great to turn it on for just a minute. If you don't, we completely understand. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you guys can see what I'm seeing. And then Mary, you just let me know that that slide deck is up and ready to go. We good? You are good. Okay, great. So um, we will talk in just a few minutes, but we are with the Center for Instructional and Behavioral Research in Schools, which is out of the University of Louisville, um, and we support Kentucky MTSS technical assistance across the state, and we're working with PBIS through the Office of Continuous Improvement. So we're really excited to partner with KVEC. They're one of our favorite places to visit across the state. Um, wonderful people and always have really good trainings there. So we're super excited to be partnering with KVEC. So as an introduction this morning, just to kind of get to know who we have here um, and everybody's role, we're gonna go through a community building circle. So the first step in a community building circle, there are four parts. And the first part is just the greeting and a focusing moment. So this morning as the greeting, I just would like for you all to kind of share your name, your district, and your role, what your role is within your district. Um, trying to think if there's anything else we want to share. And then let's share what's the worst gift you have ever gotten. So I'm going to give you a second to think about that. What's the worst gift you have ever gotten? I'm going to go first to kind of model what this looks like. So as I just mentioned, I'm Megan Martin with the Center for Instructional and Behavioral Research in Schools. And the worst gift that I have ever gotten probably is a combination of gifts. Um, my mama has, she's been gone for about 10 years, but it never failed. There were uh, 11 grandkids and at Christmas, about half of us would get a gift and half of us, she would have bought a gift, but she couldn't find it. She didn't know where it was. <laughs> <laughs> we, as we got older, it was just kind of a joke and a game, like who's going to get a gift this year and whose gift is going to come, you know, like in June or July, but she would get everybody a great gift. It was just if she could find it the week of Christmas or not. Um, so sometimes you'd get them on Christmas and sometimes you'd get them a couple months later. So um I, my kids have kind of made fun of me and said I've started doing that too. So I'm going to have to be careful about that. So on my screen, I have Mary next in my box. So Mary, I'm just going to ask you to go next if you don't care. Okay. Uh, Mary Belcher. I work with KVEC. I'm instructional consultant lead. And my worst gift, I'm really trying to think. I, I cannot think of a bad gift. I'm like stumped. I'm trying to that's okay. You can pass if you would like. You I, I, I'm going to have to pass on that one because I'm always like, no, I, 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 I just, if anybody gives me any little thing, you know, all the student gifts and everything I've ever got, I've always just thought how, how, so I, I can't think of one. I'm stumped on that one. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so. Passing is perfectly fine. Um, okay. In my box next, I have Meredith. Meredith, I believe you are still muted. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm in an Uber in Miami. So if I lose connection, <laughs> I just got off a cruise and I'm trying to make all my meetings happen. 
Um, I'm Meredith Harris. I work at East Valley Elementary in Morgan County. Um, I'm a third, fourth, and fifth grade reading teacher, and the worst gift, I, gift I've ever received was a frog <laughs> from a student <laughs> in a baggie with a bow. Well, we appreciate you being here. So if we lose you, we will, this is being recorded and you will receive the recording later. So, okay. I'll say I, I should be able to be hanging here. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. We'll be safe. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Next I have Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Lisa Reed and I am with uh, Menifee County. I am the director of high quality instructional assistance systems and, um, probably the worst gift I've ever received. And it's because um, it just wasn't my favorite thing. Um, when I lived in Alaska, we went to the community Thanksgiving uh, celebration and I was given muktuk, which is frozen whale skin and blubber. And it's just frozen. It's not cooked in any way. And so you eat it frozen it's called quack uh but yes yes uh so but i graciously took it and um i think it stayed in my freezer probably until i left <laughs> so uh because you know i did not want to offend anyone but yeah that was uh, an interesting gift not maybe not a bad gift just an just an interesting gift very interesting okay well thank you for sharing next i have denise Denise, you're muted. I, I'm stumped. I really cannot remember getting a bad gift. Um, I, I think back, I would not ever say this in front of my husband, but the first year we were married, he got me this puke green sweatsuit for Christmas. And that's, I mean, he never picked anything out himself and it was so ugly. I mean, like I did not even want to wear it around the house, but I could not bring myself to tell him. That's the only thing I could actually think because that's my dog behind my head. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I can think of, but I would never tell him. That. I acted like okay. a lot. And Denise, what district and what is your role? Uh, I am from uh, Letcher County and I'm actually an interventionist. I'm a teacher interventionist at Cowan Elementary and I just work with kids trying to bring them up that are behind. Great. Thank you. Good to have you. Next, I have Bernadette. Good morning, Bernadette. She's looking for her button. Yeah, I had a little trouble there. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Bernadette Carpenter. Uh, I work here at KVEC. I'm the DEIB coordinator. And Megan, it's good to see you. Good to see you. And a bad gift. I remember once when I was in school, but I never would have acted like it. I got this little plastic phone and everybody else got like a Barbie, you know, when we exchanged gifts and I acted like I was fine with it, but I was a little disappointed. So I guess I could, that could fall under that. Thank you. All right. Next I have Angel Elliott. Good morning. And I am Angel Elliott. I am at East Carter Middle School in Carter County. Um, the I'm assistant principal, sorry, for our middle school. Um, I was trying to think about the worst gift. Um, this one's hard. Yes, I'm gonna, okay, so it's not the worst, but it's gonna sound like the worst. So my grandmother, um, love her soul she's passed away now but she one christmas she gave us all a towel a bath towel um and we were like mm, okay is this you know are you trying to tell us something and um the backstory is that she made ceramic dolls and so that christmas she wanted us all to take a doll home with us so while it looked like a bad gift it really wasn't it was a sweet gift Thank you. That is a very sweet gift. All right, I have Jody next. I'm Jody Blackburn, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment for Menifee County Schools. And uh, mine would probably fall into that um, 80s divorce, 
you know, child of a divorce because we moved to Kentucky and my dad was in Michigan and he was just brilliant about passive aggressive gifts, I guess, to my mother. We would laugh. We still laugh about it. One year he bought my sister and I telephones, but none of us had phone jacks. And those were like those 80s phones with all the neon wiring in them. So mom got us phone jacks in our room. And then one year he bought me a Commodore 64 computer and then bought my sister all of the games <clears throat> so that we had to share the computer and the game. So I think those were probably the most uncomfortable Christmas gifts. <laughs> but they've led to a lot of laughs because over the years we keep thinking about what else could dad have sent for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> and now they're dear friends. But at the time, the passive aggressive Christmas gifts were always a hit. That's funny, Joni. Thank you. Yes. We needed some restorative practices at that time, probably. He did, yeah. yes. And then <laughs> I have Brana. Hello, I'm Bronna Francis. I work at KVAC with SEL and some other stuff, but um, worst gift, I don't know if you can beat that Alaskan gift or not. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, we used to exchange names. So, uh, you know, I had dad's family was a big family and uh, my uncle, you know, we drew names. He got, uh, got me a little, plastic fish ball with the little fish you know the fake water and the fake fish floating around so that was horrible <laughs> but, I don't know I guess that's about it okay all right well thank you all so if we were doing a community building circle we have just introduced ourselves we have learned our role in our district and then just a little something about each of us so that is the first component of a community building circle. And then the second component, as you can see on the screen, is a connection or a feelings check-in. So we're not going to do feelings because we are just getting to know each other. We're just going to do a quick connection. So the question I have for you is, how are you feeling this morning as far as energy levels? Are you a one, a two, or a three? So a one is, I'm really tired. I know it's been a holiday week, but I'm so glad it's Friday. Two is, I'm glad to be here, but I have a million other things I should be doing at the same time. And then three is, I'm super excited about restorative practices and I'm ready to go all in. So it's just, are you a one, a two, or a three this morning? And the boxes on my screen have shifted. So I'm going to go in a different order to make sure we don't miss anybody. So Bernadette, what is your number this morning? I I'm kind of a combination, but I'm really excited and um, I want to learn about restorative practices. So uh, even though I'm tired because it ha even it's been a short weekend, but it was a big weekend last, you know, a lot to do last weekend. Yes. So um, I, but I'm really excited. So I, I'm going to say I'm a three. OK, great. And then on my screen, I have Denise next. I'm kind of split. I'm got a million things I could be doing, but I'm excited. Okay. That's yeah. why I'm here. Five. Two five this morning. And then I have Jody. Yeah, I'm the same. A 2.5. The list never ends, but I'm excited to learn more and see how I can support teachers with this. Great. And then uh, Miss Elliot. Well, I'm excited to learn about this because I think it's going to help our students. Um, but yeah, I've got a million other things I could be doing. <laughs> I completely understand. Thank you. And then Bronna? I am probably a, I'm probably a two because I have company coming tonight and oh dear Lord, I've got a lot to do. <laughs> okay. Then I have Mary. I would go with the 2.5, but I'm also very happy it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, lots of things to do, but I'm excited to learn about restorative practices. Great. And then Meredith and then Lisa. I'm definitely a three. I'm really relaxed. I'm super happy to be here and I'm, I'm proud that I made it. Great. And then Lisa. I'm a three as well. I, I love restorative practices and just think that it's 
uh, what we need to do for kids. I mean, uh, we, we fall into that being a former principal and a assistant principal, we, we tend to want to bounce the, the kids out and that's an escape for them. And it's an escape for us when we know that if we focus on that tier one and keep them in the classroom where they need to be, um, that's the best place for them. That's where we expect them to be successful. So let's help them be successful there. So, um, so I, I just, I love it all. Good. All right. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. So the third component is really an activity and we're not going to do an activity this morning on our zoom. Um, there's lots of activities that are going to be in some of the resources you get that you can kind of see what those look like and we will learn about those, but it just is pretty time consuming and I want to make sure we get to all of your all's questions and we can answer everything today. Um, and then you would do some type of closing activity to complete the circle. So when you think about a community building circle within a classroom, um, we can do community building circles with staff in our schools and we'll talk a little bit about that this morning as well but those are really the two most important components is that greeting the focus and then the connection um, because when we think about community building we really are focused on building those relationships and we're going to talk a lot about relationships um, in just a few minutes so you'll get to see the community circle um, again this morning but those are the four components and i thought we would just go ahead and start that as we move into um, our introduction this morning so here's kind of what we did this morning. There's a slide in there when you get the slide deck. We've kind of already talked about who we are. And so when we think about our learning targets for this morning, um, we met with Mary and the KVEC team. We really kind of wanted to make sure that we weren't jumping in too quickly for anyone. We wanted this to be really um, an overview where we could really understand what restorative practices are, what they look like in the school setting, and then really think about the continuum of restorative practices. Because just like Lisa mentioned, this really is going to hit tier one. Um, and we're, when we think about it, it's going to focus students um, to be have more positive outcomes with tier one academic content, as well as the social skills um, and the behavior components. So we're going to talk about all of those different pieces and looking at the whole child this morning. We're going to talk about the following types of restorative practices within that continuum. Um, we just looked at community building circles. We're going to continue to talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about effective statements. And then we're going to talk about those restorative circles or conversations and restorative discipline. And so when we think about some of our Kentucky legislation, um, the School Safety and Resiliency Act is a prime example of where some of these pieces are coming from and why it's going to be so critical and so important that we implement these as we move students into that trauma safe environment within our schools. And we want to make sure that our teachers and our staff really understand the why behind it. So while I am a huge, huge fan of restorative practices, I really think that laying the groundwork and the adults and the staff within our schools um, and really that are working with kids, whether it's from the bus driver, the custodian, um, the cook in the cafeteria, that everyone really needs to understand the purpose of restorative practices before we begin <clears throat> jumping into implementing restorative practices. So by the end of um, the time together, I really want you all to be thinking about are restorative practices right for my school or my district? And if you are someone who said, I'm already at a three, I'm super excited, I'm ready to jump in, then there's some additional questions we want you to think through. Um, but we just want to make sure that we are thinking about all of the pieces before we jump in. And so we'll come back to these questions at the end. But I really want you to think about what are your current priorities and what are your current initiatives? Since COVID, we know that schools have come back full force. Um, and so we are seeing across the state, and I think that all of you all are living it every day, that oftentimes we know all of these different pieces need to be in place. And sometimes we try to do too much at one time, um, which means that everything doesn't get done as well as it needs to get done. So I want you to think about what your current initiatives are and how restorative practices would fit within that. I also want you to think about the work around restorative practices because um, we have seen, I think, since the passage of the School Safety and Residency Act in 2019, that trauma-informed practices and that training for a lot of our districts, um, sometimes administrators, sometimes teachers, but it has become somewhat of a checkbox. And so with restorative practices and with trauma-sensitive schools, it's not a checkbox. It's part of our continuous improvement process. It's part of what we are doing all day, every day within our classrooms to support students. And so it really should become part of our culture 
um, and just part of who we are as a school and as a, as a district. So this is not going to be for your school, your district, just a training and moving forward. It's really going to be what's our timeline? How are we going to plan for this? What are the different strategies that we're going to train our staff to implement? And then who's going to monitor that implementation? So you know, once we've trained the staff and this is how you implement these practices and this is what it looks like in classroom settings, is it an administrator? Is it someone that's leading from central office? Is it someone from an outside agency who's coming in? But we really have to monitor how is this going? Is it going well? Are we implementing these as they were designed? We want to make sure that we're implementing with fidelity. Um, and is there anything that we're going to stop doing in order to make room for this work? Because it is going to be a pretty heavy lift. Um, especially if you're in a smaller district. And I know that some of you are in smaller districts this morning that are on, and you, I know the, all the different hats that you wear. And so when you think about that, you know, do you have room for one more hat? Think about that as well. And then what, by the end of the, this morning, I want you all to be asking questions. What are the questions that you all have that maybe we haven't addressed, we haven't answered, and we will try to answer those um, this morning for sure. So when we think about restorative practices, we are always going to go back to our three-tiered prevention model. So when we think about Kentucky MTSS, we have these six essential elements. So when we think about the six essential elements and then our three tiers of prevention, these would be, restorative practices would fall into number five. So these are really going to be an evidence-based practice. Um, these practices can be a part of tier one, as well as responsive practices in tier two and tier three. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But I think it's really important that we connect these pieces and tie them together. We don't want anyone to think that restorative practices is in a silo somewhere over here by itself and that it's not connected um, to our instruction, that it's not connected to our problem solving process within the district. So we want to make sure that all of these things connect. Um, I think also that it really supports essential element one, which is that ex equitable access and opportunity. You know, we want to make sure we know across the state of Kentucky that we have some disproportional um, discipline rates for students um, in lots of different categories. And so I think that that's one of the pieces that when we implement restorative practices is being supported, is that we really are thinking about the students from a different lens. We are building that relationship with students that is positive in that community before we look at what is the consequence or what is the punishment. So I think that's going to be really important for you all to think about if you're going to be leading this work within your district. The next thing that I really want us to think about is that three-tiered prevention model. And so um, a lot of you have heard me say this a hundred times, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it again. We have to think about, you know, tier one, that green layer goes all the way to the tip top of our triangle. We have to make sure that all students are receiving that high quality core instruction on a daily basis. And so if we implement restorative practices, that means that all students, whether they're identified as um, needing an individualized education plan, whether they have some other type of plan, a gifted student service plan, but all students within our school setting would be receiving those tier one restorative practices on an ongoing daily basis. So when we think about tier one instruction in the classroom, um, think of it as, you know, those students have to receive those grade level standards in reading and in math, it's the exact same with restorative practices. We want to make sure that those students are always a part of that classroom and school community building um, because there may be a time when we need to use some of those responsive practices in tier two and tier three. They have to receive that tier one, have to make sure that that's for all of our students. And then we think about that tier two layer, um, you know, on top of that green, you all have heard me talk about it as paint as well. You know, you can't paint the yellow until you have a base layer of green. And so when we have data that supports that students need something additional, what is a restorative practice or what is a restorative intervention that we're going to be able to put in place to support some of those students? And then we think about our most intensive needs as that tier three layer. And we want to make sure that we have pieces in place for responding to students who are not successful with tier one instruction, but this should be the smallest group of students. We don't need to think about going to tier three before we have ever taught that tier one or layered a tier two in there. So I think that's really important to think about as well is how does MTSS and restorative practices, how do those pieces connect? How do they tie together? And what is that going to look like? So when we think about that three tiered prevention model with restorative practices, all three tiers truly are preventative. We are preventing student failure. That's the goal of MTSS. That is the goal of PBIS. We want students to be successful. It's not ever going to be looked at as a pathway to additional supports. 
But we also have to think about tier one as being the biggest part of prevention. And then when we, again, have data, it's not just what Megan thinks or what Megan feels, but it's when Megan looks at the data and the data supports a student needs something additional, then we have responsive practices ready to go in tiers two and tiers three. So I think that's, again, important <clears throat> for us to all think about because all of these things have to work together and we need to make sure that anyone we're training to implement restorative practices understands all of these different components. So I'm going to give you just a second to think about that. So my question for you all is kind of what does MTSS look like in your district right now? Do you think that all of our teachers who are implementing intervention in any capacity really understand the six essential elements? Um, are we working on that piece in our district? Do we understand <clears throat> prevention is the focus in all three tiers? Do we understand that once we have data to support, we can respond to student um, needs? Kind of what does that look like for you all? I want you just to think about that for just a second and just type something in the chat. It doesn't have to be super wordy. Just type a few thoughts in the chat about where you are as a district or as a school and how you think that would work for you right now. We'll take about a minute, give everybody time to think, and then you can drop something in the chat. So the question I've dropped in the chat is, where are we with MTSS and understanding the prevention model? So go ahead and drop something in there if you can. If you would prefer to unmute and share with us verbally, that is fine too. Whatever is easier for you. Uh, in the chat, Megan, Angel has put as a school, we are implementing in TSS, but the majority of teachers are not yet aware of all components. Okay. That's something good to think about. Thank you for sharing that. It is a big elephant sometimes um, to understand. We have to go slow for sure. Uh, Jody has put in the chat, we have strong systems in place for screening and progress monitoring, but there is a need for a deeper understanding of evidence-based interventions and consistent application with our students. We are still in a flip triangle system, so tier one is a priority. I think a lot of districts are like that. Yes, I think so too. Uh, Denise has put in, I really don't feel that there is a great understanding across the board or teacher understanding of MTSS. Okay. Well, I appreciate you all being honest and thinking about that this morning. And so um, that's something I think is going to be important for you all as you decide if restorative practices is right for you in your district or your building, you know, wherever you are in your role. Um, not that we have to completely understand MTSS to implement restorative practices, but we want to make sure that they are connected, that our teachers that are implementing and we're training, um, as well as administrators, you know, administrators are key in this work as well, because they're the ones that are going to be leading the work. Um, they need to be bought in and they need to be able to understand the restorative discipline lens as well. So I think all of those things are important as we think about restorative practices. So moving on, let's see. 
gone the wrong way. All right. So we think about what restorative practices are really restorative practices um, are a field within our social sciences. It studies how to strengthen relationships um, between individuals and really has a focus on the community. Sorry, I'm jumping around here, has a focus on the community. So when we think about the community, um, I think depending on what district you're in and what school you're in, you're going to think about that a little bit differently. So for some of us, a community may be just our individual school um, because we maybe are located in a small rural community very far outside of a town, um, or it may be that we are the only school within our district. So the other thing that's important to think about is how is our school community tied to the district community and then the district community tied to our community at large. We think about local businesses, when we think about families and all of those pieces. So there really is a strong connection to community. Um, the, the roots of restorative practices really are from indigenous communities around the world. And so we think about, you know, Native American communities um, are very rooted in restorative practices, as well as African communities and Aboriginal, um, as well as some of the native people of Hawaii. And so, you know, that's where a lot of the restorative practices um, comes from and the, a lot of the research and a lot of the books really have studied these different cultures and different communities and looked at how they um, how they handled things when they had a community member that did something inappropriate or did something to harm others and so when you start reading about restorative practices you're almost always going to find that somehow um, they're connecting that back to indigenous communities around the world and so really the outlook is about the harm that has been done and so when we think about students in schools and we think about harm, we oftentimes think about inappropriate behavior. And so are they harming, number one, themselves by exhibiting or presenting this behavior? Are they harming classroom instruction, which is what our teachers oftentimes see? Um, or are they harming relationships with other students and adults, which is, again, what we see a lot of times in schools. So we have to think about that harm. Um, and how it affects everyone. And so we know, and we have talked about for years, how you know we have students who are disrupting classroom instruction and we're handling that student's individual inappropriate behavior, but what about my other 25 kids who are really losing out on instructional minutes, so to speak, because of one student or two students' behavior. And so that's where it comes to that community piece. Um, and I think that's really important to think about as we think about the restorative practices and um, implementing those. And then restorative practices is very closely tied to restorative justice, which there's a lot more research out there on restorative justice. And so restorative justice really is a theory of justice that focus, focuses on the mediation and agreement um, of a punishment. And so when we think about the justice system, you know, typical, we're used to someone going to trial, um, being sentenced, the judge determining sentencing or a jury, you know, determining guilty or innocent. And so that is kind of where restorative practices came from is in the United States is that restorative justice piece. So we have to think about that um, and we have to think about how that connects to our kids because this oftentimes is then feeding over into students in a general high school. Um, maybe we're tying that to an alternative school. Maybe we're tying that to an alternative classroom, an in-school suspension location or an alternative placement for special education. And so we have to think about that continuum. And if we implement this in our district, what is that going to look like once we are beyond or past that place of us of a general classroom being the right educational setting or the least restrictive setting for a student? So that's something we want to kind of think about as well. So why do we need restorative practices in our schools? You all are on here today and most of you are already saying we know we need this. And so you probably already know these things. But when we think about the reasons why we need restorative practices in classrooms and in our school settings, we know historically most schools have used a punitive discipline system. Um, we do have some legislation in Kentucky, which really is moving us away from that. But I will still just say, being 100% transparent, that we have schools and districts who really feel like they are implementing trauma-informed practices really well. And when we go in and we maybe do some observations or we look at policies and procedures, their policies and procedures are still very, very punitive focused. So I'm sure those of you that are administrators and have been administrators, um, 
understand that conversation where teachers want students punished. They want them to receive some type of consequence, some type of punishment, right? And so with restorative practices, we're not in any way saying they don't receive a consequence, but the consequence may look different. So the consequence may be less punitive. The consequence is going to be more restorative. So I think that's something that's going to be really important when we start implementing and training in our in individual districts is our teachers, our administrators are going to have to understand that if we're truly implementing restorative practices, it doesn't just stop at the classroom level. That that means when a student's behavior is so extreme that I need to send them out of my classroom and an administrator needs to handle it, that that's going to be a restorative conversation as well. It's not going to go from we're going to be restorative in the classroom, but when I send them to that principal, I really want them to suspend them. I really want them to give them a consequence that means something to them, so to speak. It's not going to work like that. We have to think about that, you know, restorative discipline piece as well. So that's going to fall into our continuum when we look at that in just a minute. Um, the punishments don't teach skills that our students need. We know, and we've said a hundred times, and I know probably all of you all on here as well have said, you know, that consequence for that student, it didn't teach them what the appropriate behavior was. It didn't teach them what to do instead of um, the inappropriate behavior they're presenting. So we know that those traditional consequences and that punitive system doesn't ever teach skills. And oftentimes the consequences from these punitive systems interrupt a student's educational process. And so if we're sending them to in school suspension, if we're sending them to detention, they're losing instructional minutes with a classroom teacher oftentimes, which is not what we really want. Um, and then there's tons and tons of research also that supports when we are focused on that punitive discipline system, that oftentimes the result of that is it's leading to future inappropriate or bad, and you will notice that bad is in quotations, um, behavior. So we have to think about that as well, is, is this consequence going to help the student or is this consequence just going to reinforce that you know what, if you continue to do that, I'm going to continue to suspend you. And the kid that doesn't want to be at school anyway, he's going to continue to present that behavior because he wants to go home every single day. So we really have to think about, are we positively reinforcing negative behavior because of the system we have set up within our district? So here is a quick video with someone besides me talking a little bit about restorative practices and we could hear it earlier. So if anybody can't hear it for any reason, um, drop that in the chat and we'll try to adjust. Our world is changing at a breathtaking pace. Social patterns that have long characterized human life are changing dramatically around the globe, diminishing social bonds within families, schools, workplaces, and communities. But humans are hardwired to connect. Just as we need food, shelter, and clothing, we also need strong and meaningful relationships to thrive. With all this in mind, what is restorative practices? Restorative practices is an emerging social science that studies how to strengthen relationships between individuals and within communities. When put into practice, the effects are profound. In schools, students experience greater safety and sense of belonging, resulting in improved behavior, less bullying, and less violence. In workplaces, leaders facilitate direct communication among staff and address conflict as it arises. The result is higher performance, greater accountability, and effective collaboration. In criminal justice, new options allow victims and offenders, friends and family, to repair the emotional harm caused by crime. Throughout our neighborhoods, restorative practices give regular people more voice in the issues that matter most. In a nutshell, restorative practices is the science of relationships and community. Your individual daily interactions have a big impact on the world around you, at your job, with young people, and throughout your community. How we relate matters. This video was brought, our world is our world is changing at a breathtaking. Okay, so with that quick clip, what did that make you all think of? Did it make you think of anything that maybe has been a focus in your district that you're currently working on as an initiative? What were your thoughts as you watched that? I kind of, when I saw it, it made me think of how people are 
I know social media, they kind of seem more connected, but in ways I feel like they're more disconnected. They don't know how to relate to each other. So I was kind of thinking of it more societal than school, but you see it in the, it trickles into the schools too. But that's where my mind went was how we kind of are a little more disconnected now with each other and how to interact. I agree, Mary. I think, you know, we see it all the time with kids. We have schools that will say, well, you know, we let the kids have their phones at lunch, so to speak, or at break or whenever. And so our behaviors, maybe our discipline behaviors may be down during those times, but are kids even talking to each other? You know, that was one thing after COVID when we had kids coming back into schools that we were hearing all, all across the state was our kids can't even talk to each other. You know, they would rather text each other sitting across the table than turn and look at somebody and have a conversation or make eye contact. Um, and they're really losing some of those really critical social skills. And I don't know how many of you all have been through a drive through in the past year or so, but if you've got a teenager working the drive through it's almost painful for them sometimes to, you know, look at you and say, thanks, have a good day, or here you go. Or, you know, if you even ask them a question about, do you know if my ketchup is in the bag, they have a hard time sometimes answering those um, basic questions because they're really struggling with social skills, I think. Um, and if you have teenagers at home, I think you've probably seen it as well. Did anybody else think of anything, any other pieces besides just basic social skills? Well, Megan, you kind of already hit on it, but after COVID, when we, when everybody was back in the building, we've noticed that too, that they just don't know how to talk to one another or carry on a conversation, even with adults. Um, they'd rather just duck and hide sometimes than have to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, so like I said, you'd already hit on that, but I just wanted to add that. Thank you. I definitely think that's something we see everywhere. Anybody think about anything else? Any other thoughts? Okay, so I want you to keep thinking about that. Um, and I think that there were some pieces and components in here that really tied back to, you know, positive behavior as well, some PBIS components. And so we'll continue to kind of look at that and talk about that. So this is oh. our world is changing. At a see if we can get that. There we go. So this slide that you can see right here really is a continuum. So when we think about that continuum of restorative practices, we have the left side, which is preventative, and then we have that right side, which is responsive. So when we think about all the different pieces of restorative practices that should take place when we implement this with fidelity in a school, as you can see, we have four pieces or components on that preventative left side that should be in place before we ever start thinking about the responsive side. And so when you think about all those, it talks about identity. And so that is do we really understand and accept who our students are and who our, our students accept who each other are? Um, and then we have classroom practices and you notice under there it says procedures and routines, a safe environment. That's our classroom PBIS systems. Do we have those systems in place? Then we go to community building and community building really is tied back to our, again, School Safety and Resiliency Act with safe adults and trusted adults. Um, as you all know, every student that takes that state assessment, one of the questions is, do you have a safe, trusted adult in the school setting? Um, and in Kentucky right now, our percentages are not great. We're at about 69% of students across the board who say, yes, we have a trusted adult at school. And while that number sounds significantly high, I'm really concerned about that 31% that are saying, we don't have a trusted adult at school because we know that a lot of those kids also don't have a trusted adult in the home setting. So we have to focus on those, you know, relationships. The only piece that is in that School Safety and Resiliency Act three times, it's the only phrase that is in that entire piece of legislation three time, times is every student will be known well by at least one adult in the school setting. And it is in there three different times. And so to, that tells us that to our legislators, that was a really important component that our kids all feel like that they are wanted at school, that they belong at school, and that someone there knows them and knows not just their name, but knows something about them. You know, I know Bernadette and I know what her favorite foods are, and I know that she plays softball on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Do I know something about my kids? So that's really important when we're tying it back to that School Safety and Residency Act. And then we think about curriculum. And so, as you notice, it says social and emotional literacy. And so, you all, some of you have heard me talk about, you know, this SEL. We've talked about it for two years, like it's a magic wand or a magic pill that SEL is just going to fix everything. And 
when we think about SEL, that is social skills that we just said our kids didn't have, and it's emotional competencies. And so when we teach any type of SEL curriculum or content, we really are teaching social skills. How do we look someone in the eye? How do you introduce yourselves? Um, you know, how do you carry on a conversation with someone that you don't know? Or how do you carry on a conversation of what's appropriate to say and inappropriate to say? So, you know, those are those very basic social skills. Sometimes, you know, in the past, we've called them soft skills or job embedded skills, but those are things our kids need to know and understand to be able to be successful in the world. You know, it's we want them to be successful past just high school. We want them to be successful adults. And so those are really critical as they critical as well within that piece of prevention. So when you think about it like that, all four of those pieces, when you tie those together, that's a PBIS system. So that right there is tier one PBIS. So are we doing that within our schools? Do we have that in place? That is critical. Then when we move to the right side, we see the responsive piece. And we've talked about already this morning, responsive is going to be that tier two and that tier three and those practices that fall into those tiers. And so as you can see, you have the effective statements. It says relational conversations, but those effective statements really are going to be key in your community building circles. Then in the middle, you have circles. And we're going to talk today about two different kinds of circles because you really have community building circles and then you have restorative circles. So we need to be doing those community circles all the time. Restorative circles occur when something has happened or something is wrong within our group of students or within our school. And then the last one that you see and the one that's the darkest blue says a formal conference. And that's where we tie our administrators and our our restorative discipline component in is with that formal conference. And that's typically with an administrator or an administrator and a teacher. So I really like this continuum. Um, it comes from some of the research from early 2000s, but we are still utilizing this continuum. But you really have to think about, you can't just say, we're gonna do restorative circles and not consider any of the other pieces of that continuum. So I think that's important as we think about what um, is gonna work for us best. So when we think about restorative practices, we've already talked about PBIS and really what that looks like. So here are some of the components that I'm guessing probably are occurring within your school with your positive behavior interventions and supports. So when you think about PBIS and that big umbrella, restorative practices would fit under that PBIS umbrella. So if you have any questions about the PBIS and restorative practices, drop those in the chat. I'm going to continue talking just for, for time this morning. Um, but as I continue talking, if you have some questions, go ahead and drop those in and we'll try to address them. So, you know, when you think about an effective PBIS system, consequences should be instructional in nature. So when we are giving a consequence, which is perfectly fine to do, oftentimes people will say, now, Megan, that PBIS, I just don't like it because you can't punish kids or you can't give them a consequence. Yes, you can. So with effective PBIS, we give students a consequence. The consequence just teaches them a different way to do something. So the consequence should be instructional in nature. We're always going to tie back to our school-wide anchors, which is something we should have established. We're going to think about the event and how it relates to the environment. And I know that those of you that deal with explosive kids or have maybe ever been a special education teacher or EBD kids, worked with them a lot, um, you understand what we're talking about. We think about that environment. And so we think about triggers for students. And oftentimes the triggers are something within the environment. So are we able to identify those and reduce those triggers? Um, you know, for a lot of our kids, classrooms may be too loud. Our lunchrooms may be too loud. Our classrooms may not have clear instructions and be a little chaotic. Um, the teacher's voice may be a little bit loud. So we have to think about all of those pieces with that environment component as well. And then we also want to think about all of those consequences being trauma-informed. So are they trauma-informed and are they culturally responsive? So what does that mean for us? When we think about that culturally responsive piece, is this behavior something that in my home environment and with my family culture and context is perfectly acceptable? And for a lot of our kids, it is. You know, I know that you all have heard kids say, well, I wasn't being disrespectful. And you've got an adult standing there going, he talked to me so disrespectfully and he was just rude and on and on and on. But for that student, 
That may be the only way they've ever heard anyone talk to another person. Parents, family members, if they are lucky enough to have parents in the home, right? Um, they, it may be mom and boyfriend of the week that they have lived with for their eight years that they've been alive. And they think when you have a conflict, we hit and we kick and we fight. That's how they have seen adults resolve conflicts their entire life. So when we think about those culturally responsive practices, that's what we're talking about is, is this behavior they're presenting at school acceptable in another environment that they are familiar with? And we have to teach them, give them instruction on why that's not okay at school. This is a more appropriate way to handle that. So I think that's important to think about with um, the PBIS, as well as tying that to restorative practices. So when we think about effective PBIS, we should not be relying on exclusion. And so we know that that's one of the pieces across the state of Kentucky we have been very focused on is ensuring that we are not removing students from instructional minutes longer than necessary. We want them at school. We want them in class. Um, somebody earlier mentioned that. I think that it was Lisa that said, you know, we know that those kids need that tier one academic instruction. That's the most important thing they can get. So when we're giving consequences that remove them from that instruction, we're not implementing the way it's designed to be um, implemented. We also want to think about taking away things that students have earned. And so with PBIS, those of you that have implemented and set up systems, you know that we want students to earn um, privileges. We want students to earn, whether it's points or dollars or tickets or whatever it is you use, we shouldn't be taking things from students that they have already earned. And so that's one of the things that we see with PBIS and restorative practices that really um, ties them together because once a student has earned something, they've earned that piece, whatever it is. And with restorative practices, if they exhibit a behavior that's inappropriate, how can we handle that restoratively instead of punitively by saying you've lost your point, you've lost your dollar, you've lost your ticket, whatever that is. We also want to think about how long it is between the behavior a student presents and the consequence that they receive. So, you know, sometimes with PBIS, I've seen schools and districts have systems um, that a student may exhibit behavior on June 1st and their consequence for that behavior that they presented on June 1st doesn't happen until July 1st. So we have to think about that timeline and the age and make sure they're age appropriate. So those are some pieces from PBIS that are really important as we think about tying that to um, restorative practices. So again, we think about PBIS and that connection. We have differentiated instruction for teaching behavior. We have those clearly defined behavioral expectations and those behavioral expectations are taught on an ongoing basis. It's not just something we teach the first you know, 10 days of school, as Harry Wong used to say, nope, we teach those 175 days of school until the very last day of school. We're teaching those expectations and what we expect from students. We have an appropriate acknowledgement system in place. And then we have effective consequences that are teaching something as a replacement behavior when students behave inappropriately. We're utilizing data. And then we're going back and going through that data decision-making process. So we have effective PBIS at tier one, that's going to make a huge difference when we think about restorative practices. So if we think about that continuum and moving along the continuum, identity was the very first piece on our continuum. So are we understanding the function of students' behavior in classrooms as the adults? And are we understanding, do we have an understanding of how trauma impacts students and what they present as far as behavior in classrooms? That's really step one on that continuum. When we move to step two, that's looking at PBIS practices school-wide. Do we have school-wide PBIS? Do we have classroom expectations in place? Within PBIS, we know that we should have a safe and positive culture and climate. So that's classroom as well as school-wide. And then our School Safety and Resiliency Act really does specify that we have trauma-informed practices in place in our schools. We have to have that trauma team at the school level, and we have to have a trauma plan at the district level. So are those pieces in place? Then we Megan, think of, yes. we do have a great question in the chat. Angel has asked, when it comes to time after the incident occurs, if a student is absent for a week, do you still discuss or have a consequence? That's a great question. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so we can't always control those things such as absenteeism. 
But when the student returns, you know, and that may very well be the reason they're not at school. They know that, right? Um, but when the student returns, that should be one of the very first things that we do is discuss with them. You know, we know it's been seven days. We know it's been 10 days since this occurred, but we have to address it. It also is really important to think about the age of the student. So if you think about a student that's a kindergartner that's out seven days, they may have trouble recalling that exact incident where you think about, you know, a freshman or sophomore in high school, they're going to have a very crisp and clear memory of that incident, even if it was seven or 10 days ago. So I think that's really important to think about is how we're addressing that um, and the age of the student. Now, I will say that probably if it was set, depending again, depending on the behavior, if it's something that was not um, putting anyone's safety at risk, you would not want to pull them in first thing on their day to return and say, okay, you've been out seven days, but you're immediately going to be suspended another three days. You know, if they have returned to school, you might want to think about, you know, I have a couple options as an administrator, I can suspend you or I can put you in in-school suspension. But as an administrator, I always want my kids there. So if in-school suspension is an option, um, is that a consequence that's appropriate for the behavior? And I would much rather have them in school getting content than at home having access to whatever they want, playing get video games all night, sleeping all day, <laughs> you know, all of those pieces. So a lot of different, um, a lot of different factors to think about there. But yes, I think you always, you don't just let things go because a student has been out. Did that help answer that question or did it? muddy the waters. <laughs> no, it helped. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Then the other preventative piece is that community building and relationships. And I know that um, Bernadette and Brana are both on today and both of them work really hard with SEL and DEIB and making sure that students, you know, we understand what does it feel like to belong in a school? Um, what are those pieces? So, you know, that community building and those relationships are key. And I'm pretty sure that everybody that's on today really knows and understands the value of those relationships with students and, you know, what a difference those can make. So I want you to think about relationships and how critical those are um, within this restorative practices piece, because this is all built on positive relationships for students to other students, for students to adults, um, and really adults to adults. I've worked with a couple different school districts who it was really a toxic environment for adults working in some of the schools or at the district level, and restorative practices was really able to help with that situation um, because we were building those positive relationships with adults as well. And sometimes the adult piece needs to come first before you even think about building those relationships with students. The students see what happens. They read our emotions, they read our faces, they read our body language. And if they're watching those things with adults in a school setting, that is not, not always great. Um, and so with our community building, that's where our community building circles come in. And then the curriculum, we already talked about SEL. So let's take just a second. And I want you all just to drop in the chat kind of what SEL looks like in your district or your school. Is it something that you have in place? Is it something that you, what I'm seeing and hearing a lot of right now is, you know, we have SEL, we have this program, but our teachers aren't really teaching it or they say they're not comfortable teaching it. So we don't really know how much of that social, those social skills, you know, kids are actually getting or we have somebody who comes in once a month to classrooms and delivers that. So just kind of drop in the chat and we'll talk about that just a little bit. What does SEL look like for your district or your school right now? Where are you with that? One of the other things with SEL, um, as you're thinking about this is, you know, we've got that castle wheel up at the top and we think about those five competencies. I think that you would find very few places where if you went in and talked to teachers and said, talk to me about SEL, that they would ever mention these competencies. I don't think our teachers understand. They think SEL is a program, a, a scripted curriculum. I don't think that they really understand that no matter what SEL we're focused on as far as programming, these are the five things that we should be teaching. These are our five competencies, and this is what everything ties back to. Um, in the chat, Megan, we have, uh, we know what it is, but only a few teachers are really teaching it. Uh, another comment, inconsistent. In the beginning stages, each school has their own process. 
Okay. Just another comment. Anybody else? A couple more just came in. Uh, we are adopting character strong for 23-24. Right now we are inconsistent, although we've had various curriculums in place. Another comment, we have a program in place. There is not enough time in the day to teach everything that needs to be taught. Uh, I, hear that, I hear that a lot too. Another is we are really trying, but there is some inconsistency. We have a curriculum. Another says individual teachers are working on those soft skills, but not there yet as a school. And uh, we have a lot of time set for it daily. We are all on board. However, I do not know that is true for the entire district. Yeah. So lots of lots of different things going on with SEL, um, you know, and it's great to have a curriculum and have a program, but those are really expensive. And so if you're a district that you have utilized some of your ESSER funds or um, whatever the funds are, where your curriculum came from, and then they just put on a shelf or it's a computer program that we never open, it's not doing us a lot of good. Um, so I think there's a lot of different pieces with that. And Bronna and Bernadette, you all jump in if you want to, but. I think SEL is something that, you know, again, we thought it was like this magic wand that was going to come in and fix everything. And while it's great, those are really just social skills that your really good, strong teachers teach those naturally anyway. And your teachers who are uncomfortable teaching them really struggle with them themselves. And so we have to think about how can we build those skills within our adults in order for them to be able to teach them to students a lot of times. And, you know, Megan, I, I've said this many times before, but I think if they will ever start doing that and addressing the diversity and the equity and the inclusion and kids feel like they belong, you're going to do away with a lot of those uh, classroom behavior problems. So um, it, it's just so important because every kid wants to feel like they belong, you know. And so does every adult, you know, I think that's absolutely, absolutely. true with adults too. When we have teachers who feel like they don't fit into the school or they're not yeah. a part of the school, that makes a huge difference too. So I agree. I totally agree with that. Anybody else have any thoughts on the SEL? And uh, Megan, I always tell them, and I mean, uh, they're, you know, about having so much on their plate. And I realize that, but I tell them with SEL, that's the plate you start with that makes everything else better, you know? Yes, absolutely. So we're moving from prevention. Sorry, my um, screen keeps flipping back and forth. We're moving from prevention into responsiveness, right? So when we think another, about- Another comment, sorry, Megan. Oh, I good. noticed that some, some teachers feel that it won't ever help, but then the same kid walks in my room and we connect and it's totally different experience. So uh, with Meredith there in the chat. So kind of connecting to what uh, Bernadette and Ronald were sharing too. Absolutely. It goes back to that adult. Absolutely. You know, I, and I always say your, your kids that really are usually presenting your most extreme behaviors can probably read you better than any kid in your room. And they know from the second they walk through the door, either she wants me here or she doesn't. She's glad to see me today or she could care less if I'm here. You know, and there's a million things that go into that. But those kids know. Those kids immediately know. So, so when we think about responsive restorative practices. Sorry, Mary. I'm sorry. The things they're they're doing great. I love all this in the chat. Uh, uh, Affirmation with Denise saying, see that a lot. Uh, I am more motivated to change some of my partners than the child, uh, is, is a comment also made. Yes. Yep. So we're moving to the responsive piece, right? So when we think about responsive, these are our three responsive pieces that we're going to kind of go over today and think about what this would look like if you were to implement, train, implement, and monitor within your district or your school. So we're going to talk a little bit about effective statements. We're going to talk about those restorative conversations and circles, and then that restorative discipline piece. So it is 10, 10, and I know we started at nine. Mary, do we need a quick few minutes break? How do you all typically, I should have asked before we started, sorry. Anybody need a pause for just a second to get a drink or anything? It would probably be good to have just a little stretch break for everybody. Uh, how long would you want to do that uh, for? Okay, five minutes good. Yeah, so 10, 15, 10, 16, come back. 
That sounds good. Let's try to be back around 10, 15 and we'll get started. Sounds great. Thank you. Megan, we had a couple more people come on. I had some, I don't know what happened, but when I went back and checked my restorative practices registration list, I thought, well, I'm going to just hit refresh and make sure nobody else had, we had three more people pop up on the list. So they joined a little bit later, but I will take the blame in that something technically glitchy happened there. So they, they have joined us. So, so glad that they were able to make it and apologize for the delay for them. That's great. So Mary, do you want to let them introduce themselves or what? Uh, if they would feel comfortable with that, I think that would be great. Uh, the ones that got the email late, and like I said, I take full responsibility for that, would be, uh, let me see, Ryan Francis, uh, Kristen Potter, and Meredith Stiltmer. Okay. I can't see the participants, so sorry. Okay. So, uh, Ryan, would you want to unmute and just introduce yourself of where uh, your name, your role? Um, uh, what district you're with? Uh, yeah, I'm Ryan Francis. I am an English teacher at Hazard High School. Welcome. So glad to have you today. Uh, Kristen Potter, would you want to unmute and introduce yourself? I'll see you next. Hi, yes, I'm Kristen Potter. I'm with Pikeville Independent School District. I just got the job of um, being assistant principal after teaching for 15 years, so I'm super excited. Welcome, so glad you're here and congratulations. You'll do awesome. And Mary Beth Stiltner, will you? Hi there, I'm Mary Beth Stiltner. I'm here in Pike County. Congratulations, Kristen. We're really proud of you. So glad you made it today, Mary Beth. Thanks for being here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having us. All right, that got everybody, Megan. Thank you. I don't think, I think everybody else did get to introduce themselves and share. I don't think we're looking over anybody. Thank you. Sounds good. So as we jump back in, we are in the place where we are ready to talk about our responsive practices. And so when we think about responsive practices, we're going to start with effective statements. Um, I don't know if anybody on here has a counseling background. That is my background. And so when we start talking about effective statements, sometimes I get a little carried away because I feel like I'm in counseling again. Um, but when we think about effective statements, it's really just sharing how we communicate. And so we'll go ahead and jump into effective statements, what that looks like, and what those are. So as you can see here, it says effective statements really are a personal expression about how you feel, about how I feel, someone feels in response to a behavior. So we want to make sure that we're using I statements. Um, and those of you that I have known for a while and know that I'm a big supporter of de-escalation. Um, and so when we think about de-escalation, I kind of think about effective statements with restorative practices as to how we would talk to kids when we're de-escalating them. So when we think about de-escalation, we always want to say I or we instead of you, because immediately when we say you and we use that word, it indicates that we are placing blame on someone, whether that's blame on another adult, whether that's blame on the student. But when we use I and we statements, it removes that feeling of blame. And so with effective statements with restorative practices, it's exactly the same. So again, what do I feel and why do I feel that way? Not that it's right, not that it makes it the correct feeling, but for that person, for the student, for the adult, that is what they're feeling. And so that's part of restorative practices is building relationships and people have to be honest about that. So as you can see, we're going to be using some I statements. It makes the person who caused the harm, sometimes in RP we refer to them as the harmer, um, aware of the impact of their actions. And so a lot of times that's something that kids struggle with is I presented this behavior, but that didn't do anything to anyone else. And so with restorative practices, restorative justice, that's really the focus is how did my actions impact other people? Um, because if we're focused on that community and building that strong sense of community and relationships, we have to think about how my actions impacted my relationship with someone else. 
So here are some examples. I feel frustrated when questions aren't addressed during training. I would say we can all relate to that, um, but it's just a very simple way of thinking about an effective statement. I feel angry when the class is disrupted because it makes it harder for other students to learn. And so that statement could have been made by a teacher or that statement could have been made by a student. So thinking about the frustration that teachers or students feel when other kids are constantly disrupting. That's kind of that middle statement. And then over there on the right, really that statement is probably coming from a teacher. I feel happy when my class completes assignments because it shows me how well everyone understands the content or the topic. So I want you to think about these statements and think about the emotion, think about the feeling. So in statement one, the feeling is frustration. In statement two, the feeling is anger. And in statement three, the feeling is happy. So how many of you all have seen students who struggle with what the emotion is? They can't identify feelings. Anybody ever seen kids that really struggle with feelings? Yeah, or they only know two, right? Happy and angry. <laughs> yes. There's nothing in between. Yes. Or they use inappropriate words for feelings that mean angry, right? Right, uh, yeah. So when we think about effective statements, we have to make sure that when we are teaching effective statements and we're using effective statements with students, we're also teaching them about feelings. And so where would that tie back to that we've already talked about? Where do students learn about identifying feelings and talking about those feelings? Where might that happen? That was in that first stage, right? That identity, right? With yes. And so you think about that's our whole preventative piece. So that's a part of PBIS. And it's really a part of our social emotional learning when we think about that. Students have to be able to identify what is anger? How do I feel when I'm angry? Does my face get red? Are my hands hot? You know, am I sweaty? So we have to think about identifying feelings and we have to teach kids to do that before they're ever going to be able to do effective statements appropriately. Um, historically, I have worked with our juvenile justice system across the state of Kentucky. And so it amazes me still that we have, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old offenders in the state of Kentucky who are in some of our level three and level five facilities. <clears throat> And so they may be 6'3 and 250 pounds, but when you say to some of those youth something about being angry, the response is, what are you talking about? I'm not effing angry. So those kids that look very much like adults and have committed crimes that are very much adult crimes, they can't even identify their emotions or their feelings. And so I think we have to think about that when we're talking about restorative practices and we're talking about teaching kids effective statements, because if they don't understand effective statements, restorative practices is never gonna work. We have some districts and some schools who have worked on and practiced effective statements for an entire year before they ever moved into anything else. So effective statements are foundational with restorative practices. They are really important. So with effective statements, you're also going to refer and teach students to refer to the behavior. <clears throat> this is something that some of our adults struggle with too. So we're not focused on the feeling at this point. We're focused on the behavior. When I'm yelled at or shouted at, I, and then you have them identify the feeling. I feel embarrassed. I feel angry, you know, whatever that is. When I'm sworn at, I, and then what's the feeling that comes along with that? So you have to think about effective statements in two parts. You have to think about identifying the behavior and then the feeling that goes with it. Now, just because student A says, when I'm shouted at, I feel embarrassed, student B may not feel embarrassed at all. And so every effective statement is very individualized. It's unique and there is no wrong. So we can't say to a student, you don't feel embarrassed or you should not feel embarrassed. If that is the feeling that comes with them being yelled at in class, then that is their emotion. That is their feeling. So we're not ever as adults going to identify that a student can't have a feeling, even though it may not be a normal feeling with the behavior. We're always going to go back to that's their feeling, right? Some other examples you can see on here is when I hear please and thank you, I maybe it's feel appreciated. 
when I see you following directions for the first time, I, I want you all to think about what emotion you would tie to statements four, five, six, and seven. So all of you just read those and think about what the feeling is that you would tie to that behavior. So let's start with number four. When I see you following directions for the first time, I, go ahead and type in the chat. Finish that statement in the chat. I what? Excited, feel effective. Excited, feel happy. Awesome. All right. I'm so happy. There you go. Great. Now let's look at number five. When I hear you talking while I'm talking, finish that statement. Number five. I feel disrespected, frustrated. I feel disrespected. Disrespected. I feel like you weren't listening. Okay, great. And then let's look at number six. When I see you come in late, finish that statement. When I see you come in late, I wonder what your morning was like. Okay. So I'm going to use. I'm happy. I'm happy that you still made it. I love that, Mary. <laughs> That's cute. I like it. So I'm going to use angels for a quick example. Okay. So Angel has said, "When I see you come in late, I wonder what your morning was like." So her mind immediately goes to, is this kid okay, right? Like that's what she is thinking is like, but what's the feeling, maybe worried or concerned? So when you think about it like that, like you immediately jump to what's happened this morning. Is my child okay? Do they need anything? But the emotion that's tied to it would probably be worry or concern. So I think it's really important for us as adults to be able to model those things for students. But as you can see, if you don't have a counseling background, it's going to take a little time to get used to tying a behavior to a feeling and then identifying that and talking about it out loud. Now, I want you to also think about if this is not an adult and this is a student, what, might el what else might be going on while they're saying some of these things? So does a student calmly say, when I'm shouted at, I feel disrespected? What is the student's behavior? What are they actually doing sometimes? Think about that. Anybody? Well, if they're being shouted at, they might be replying in, an, in another aggressive way. Yes. So aggression. Shouting language. back. Yeah. Shouting back. What else? Or turtling the opposite where they turtle in, you know, and there's just no, yeah. they just close down. Withdraw and shut down. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody have any other thoughts? Leave. They might leave. They might try to escape. I've seen a lot of kids that when they yell, they get yelled at, they're flipping chairs, they're throwing a desk, they're ripping paper up, right? So immediately when that is their reaction, they're not going to be able to say, when I'm shouted at, I feel really embarrassed. They're embarrassed is their behavior. Their behavior is speaking for them. So it's going to take a long time to teach students how to use this language, what to say, how to identify emotion. So I want you to think about that in whatever context you're in. If you're in an elementary school, like what might that look like? If you're in a high school, what might like that look like? Because if you get to, you know, you're a six, got a 16 year old, instead of turning to a peer and saying, when you yell at me, I feel really disrespected they may turn to that peer and punch them immediately, right? That's their behavior. That's their reaction. So I want you to think about what it would take to teach students some of the things we're talking about with effective statements. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, okay? So thank you all for participating. And then we've already talked about this. We're going to talk about how that behavior makes us, how, it, how we feel about that, right?
we really have already gone through this. So I want you to think about some of these examples as you continue to think about what it would look like in your setting. So example A says a father wants his young child to stop calling him rude names during the playtime, the common response. Hey, if you call me a rude name one more time, I'm going to send you straight to bed. I'm going to send you to your room. The I statement in replace of that would be, I feel very sad when I hear rude words because they hurt my feelings. I like playing with people who use nice words. Now, as a parent, as a teacher, does that I statement, would that come naturally to you? If you say yes, I'm going to be super impressed because it would not come naturally to me immediately. I can no. take it. So these I statements are not things that as adults are going to come really natural. We're going to have to focus. We're going to have to concentrate and we're going to have to practice these things. So earlier I said, um, you know, I have a middle school that they have worked on effective statements this entire school year. They have a once a month faculty meeting. They do about five to 10 minutes of effective statements every faculty meeting once a week. And then they practice them once a week in their PLCs as well, because they knew that they have a very young staff and it's gonna take a long time for their staff and their faculty to understand and be able to do these effective statements before they ever start teaching them to students. So I want you to kind of think about what that would look like. We can't just do a one hour overview of effective statements and expect that all the adults in, the, in our school settings are gonna be able to do them because they're not, it's gonna be really hard. Let's in, the look chat at it, in the chat, it says, I think it takes a lot of work being professional through and through. Yes, absolutely. So it has to be a priority for sure. So let's look at example two. A woman becomes angry when her sister borrows her favorite coat and returns it with stains and a tear. So in school settings, we don't necessarily borrow clothes, but what might one student borrow from another? Pencil. And so uh, materials typically, right? Some type of material. Yeah. So a common response might be, you ruined my jacket. Are you ever going to grow up? Where an I statement would be, I'm upset that my coat was damaged because I can't afford to replace it. I really appreciate it when the things I loan out are taken care of. Now, do you hear any middle school or high school kids saying, I'm upset that you damaged my pen when I let you borrow it in algebra? because I don't hear that from students, right? So it's going to, again, take a lot of practice to get to this point. Let's look at example three. A teenage boy is annoyed with his parents who ask him several times each night if he has completed his homework. I don't know if any of you all have dealt with this, but I have, a, I had a senior this year that just graduated and I mean, I've probably asked him a million times this year about homework. So I feel like this is very much, I have lived this. A common response from a teenager may be lay off of me or why do you care? The I statement would be, I feel frustrated and annoyed when I'm reminded over and over to do my homework. I'm old enough now to complete it without the reminders. Now, whether that's true or not, <laughs> that would be an I statement, right? So just a couple more examples of what these I statements might look like. Um, we're not gonna go through this for um, time's sake I do want to stop right here let me go back one actually I want to stop right here and I want you all to think about and let's just have a quick conversation what would it take what would this look like if we were to implement effective statements in our setting so think about that and I know some of you have already kind of dropped a few things in the chat but this is not something that would happen quick and easy so what are your thoughts right now with effective statements with our first practice okay. Oh, sorry. I'm Go sorry. ahead, Denise. I think that it would look different at different age levels. Sure. I think that little kids more need to be taught. Some need empathy mm -hmm. to be taught empathy before they can get there. Um, during COVID, we did this thing where as soon as we came on, this a student had to say something positive to another student. I like. Sarah because she's kind and nice or whatever because we just didn't have those social skills and you would not believe the difference that it's set up in the tone of those meetings because little kids really don't have that COVID really damaged that that's my take older kids would be different than younger kids in that yes I think depending on the age it's going to look very different for sure 
can you see where these effective statements might naturally become part of a social skills time or a social skills instruction? Anybody seeing that? In the chat, I think a lot of behaviors could be diffused before they grow if this happens. Uh, also, we said uh, another one had commented earlier, but I, I also feel that tone and body language are so important when using these statements, they must match. Yes. So when you think about tone and body language, that goes back to our SEL competencies, right? Effective communication, do we know how to communicate? So effective statements, I see them tying very, very closely to your SEL instruction. Um, I know a lot of elementary schools since COVID have gone to having some type of morning meeting. It may be three minutes, it may be five minutes, but some type of morning meeting. I know a lot of our schools also um, are still doing some type of, you know, morning announcement, morning broadcast, whether that's, you know, a news station or just an administrator. But think about how you could tie effective statements into something that already exists within your school. So that would be one way to kind of get started with restorative practices is learning about effective statements, having staff and adults learn about effective statements and use them and practicing them, and then tying it to something that's already there. If you have a five minute SEL time from eight to 8.05 that every teacher is supposed to be doing that, maybe we just start making sure that our adults understand effective statements and tying that to some of that content that's going on. So think about what you have that already exists so you're not setting up brand new systems. Again, we wanna connect this to pieces that are already in place. It's not something brand new and that you could bring in effective statements. I think that's gonna be important for everybody. Anybody at the high school have something that you were thinking um, high school level. A lot of our high schools um, have some type of advisory, um, homeroom, something of that nature. And so they may think about effective statements and what that looks like or sounds like. Um, I have a couple high schools that had, again, a very young staff, a lot of teachers that came out of non-traditional um, teaching programs. And so they sent out like five effective statements a week to teachers, to full, full faculty, and teachers were to utilize those during fourth period because fourth period was where advisory was. And so at some point during the week, teachers were asked to talk to students about these five statements and they did five statements every week for the spring semester. So something very simple like that, it doesn't have to be a huge undertaking, but think about how this could connect to something that already is in place or already exists, okay? Any questions about effective statements before we move on to our next practice? pause for just a second. Any questions? Effective statements are not as easy as you think. It takes some practice. You really have to practice. I think that's a big part of it when I'm thinking about like supporting new teachers is I, we're going to have to practice. I like your stems, practicing with the stems. So that, you know, teachers didn't have to think about it themselves. It was sent out. Everybody got the same ones. We might talk about them at the faculty meeting the week before and then talk about them the following week in class or whatever that looks like. You also could just do one a week, you know, for middle school, high school. You could do four a month, one a week, and say, we're going to talk about these every Monday morning during our SEL time or just something simple like that. But think about some simple ways that you could start this process. Thank you, Jody. Any other questions? Okay. We are going to move into restorative circles. So again, I'm gonna play this really short clip and hear a little bit about the restorative circle, all right? So again, think about that community restorative circle. Circles, it's kind of awkward at first. I feel it's some students are shy because they, they don't know anyone else in the circle, but as more time goes by and the more circles you have with the same people, you start to create a relationship with them. And you, you talk about stuff that you didn't think that someone else would be able to relate to, like your experiences in life outside of school. It felt like a kind of like get together or a bonfire, but in a classroom, which was unusual. And we got to see each other in different light, the teachers and our peers. I think it's that no matter what, we always want to get to know people better. 
Our teachers want to get to know us better, and we want to get to know them better. Um, circles um, is kind of like a team exercise. I feel like a lot of people don't talk at first because they're shy. I was in a class this year after COVID. I feel like no one really talked to each other in class anymore. And we did a circle and nobody was talking. I kind of broke the ice because I'm always talking. And um, I, ever, I talked to people for the first time all year that I'd never talked to just because of the circle. I feel like it makes me more comfortable with the people I'm around. Like if I need something, I'm not scared to ask. Um, like if I need help on work, uh, if I say I talk to someone, people in my circle, I'll know that I can ask them instead of like, oh, what if I look weird? Or what if I look like I don't know anything? I think it makes me definitely more able to ask somebody something. I feel like everyone is addressed in a circle. Okay. So with that, she kind of talked a little bit about everyone being addressed in the circle. So let's talk about some of those community building circles, kind of like we did this morning. When we think about that community building circle, we want everyone to be addressed and we want everyone to have an opportunity to speak. But if there is a student or an adult and we're doing a circle and they're uncomfortable sharing or uncomfortable talking, we have to allow them that to to be a part of the circle but they don't have to share so i want you to always remember that because oftentimes when we talk about restorative practices that's one of the first questions is like okay megan in theory this sounds great but if i've got my kid over here who cleared my classroom twice yesterday this restorative circle is going to set him off he doesn't want to talk he doesn't want to share anything then let him just sit let him be a part of it he can hear what other people are saying but he doesn't have to necessarily speak. So that's always okay as well. And I want to make sure we address that because we want to make sure everybody's included, but that they don't have to speak if they do not feel comfortable doing so at that time. Now, if we get to a place where we have a restorative circle and we have 10 kids in a restorative circle and nine out of 10 don't talk, then what I would say is all the kids are so uncomfortable that we're going to break into smaller circles. So you can do a restorative circle that's as big as 50 people, you can do a restorative circle that is as small as three. So you have to have three to make a circle. Two is a pair and three is a circle. But if your kids are still uncomfortable or adults are still uncomfortable in the size of circle that you have in a classroom, start breaking it down into smaller circles. So if I've got a classroom of 20 kids, I could do four circles of five. I could do five circles of four. So that's okay too, to start very small, right? You want to give them clear expectations and clear directions, but you can start small. The other thing that I think is important, we start thinking about the circles, and it, we were not able to do this because we're virtual today, but did you notice the yardstick that the kids were holding? Anybody notice the yardstick? So that is what's called a talking piece. So a talking piece is really important in a circle because it kind of shows who is the speaker, who are the listeners, and it creates organization um, and that the circle goes in an orderly fashion, whatever way that is, if you're the one, you know, leading that circle. It can be a small item. It needs to be something that kids can hold. So during COVID, we had imaginary talking pieces. So like we would have a talking piece that we would say, okay, I'm holding my talking piece and it's a red ball. And you would imagine, you would imagine that you were passing it to the next person, but there wasn't really anything that was being passed along because of the germ situation. I feel like in most of our schools now, we're past that. So when you think about that talking piece, it can be something small, but it really should have meaning to your group. So whatever group you are utilizing for your circles, it should have meaning. So I have some schools that have, um, there's a high school that their mascot is a cardinal and they ordered every single classroom teacher about a three inch plastic cardinal. And that is their talking piece in classrooms. Um, they were using the yardstick. If you're a math teacher, you might want a yardstick because that has, you know, it has measurement on it and that's part of your content. So your talking piece can be whatever you want it to be. Here are some examples. Um, a lot of schools are utilizing some type of mascot as a talking piece. I would consider, um, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe myself. So I would consider like you see the turtle that looks like a stuffed animal. Like, how often are we going to need to wash that? How are we sanitizing that? Where if you have something that's plastic, you can sanitize it, Lysol, wipes, you know, much easier. 
So you might want to think about those things. Um, but it really can be anything that you want it to be. Have any of you all seen talking pieces that you really love or are any of you all using any already um, that you want to share with us? Anybody already have talking pieces? I have a rain stick, Megan. Oh, there's a, I have a rain stick. And when I, I taught fifth grade, I think that these, the morning meetings, and then I always did one at the end of the day too. And you're right about the talking piece. And, and we, my goal was always to get to a place where you, they could just have some more natural conversation. We didn't quite get there. So the, the rain stick worked, but even when I lead PDs in the district or work with teachers, I pull out the rain stick and they'll kind of giggle or laugh or think it's silly, but, but it works. It does. Yes. It absolutely helps with that. You know, sometimes it's uncomfortable in some of those conversations. And so it really says right now, Jody has the floor when she has the rain stick, no one else is talking. We're going to be respectful, you know, those pieces. So it is. Well, and it served a nice dual purpose because it was also my, I didn't have to say anything to get students attention. I would just we could be in the middle of group projects, turn over the rain stick, and they just knew that sound was our cue, so. And I don't know how big your rain stick is, but I mean, you can get small rain sticks that are like maybe six to 12 inches, and then you can have giant ones. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be something that's huge, yeah. um, and it can still serve that same purpose. So, thank you. Yes, that's a great one. Anybody have anything else you're using? So, be thinking about that is if I were to implement circles, what would my Talking piece B, what would that look I like? I have community circles. Okay. We're going to move right along. So again, we're going back to the components of that class community building circle, and you have four parts to every circle. So you have that greeting focus. For those of you that missed that this morning, component one is the greeting and the focus. Then we go to some type of check-in. Now, if you are teaching content and you want to do a circle, your connection can be something content related. It doesn't have to be a feeling or a check-in. Oftentimes when I'm doing trainings, I may say something like, you know, we're, we're going to be learning about MTSS today, for example. So I want you to tell me how you feel on a scale from one to five about MTSS. One is that you are not excited at all to be here and it's a thorn in your side. And five is like you love MTSS and you want to live it and breathe it, you know, so you can, you can add content into this based upon what you're teaching um, and your context. Then you're going to have a quick little activity. If there is any part of the community circle that you don't do for time consideration, it's the activity, okay? And then you're going to have a closing piece. So the greeting, the focus, then the connection, the feeling check-in or something content related, then your activity, then your closing. So these are the four parts of all of our community building circles. And so we think about that greeting and that focus. It really is just kind of setting the tone. It's a positive tone, setting the tone. Everybody again is included. You want to make sure that you say students' names or if you're doing it with staff, you say everyone's name. We have tons of research that supports when someone's name is said specifically and pronounced correctly, that's another piece of the research, you have to pronounce their names correctly, that they feel like they belong, they feel included, and they feel like they're wanted in that situation. So if it's a name that we're unfamiliar with or we're uncomfortable with, make sure you ask the student, hey, pronounce your name for me. I want to make sure I'm saying it right. You know, sometimes we have kids' names that are really difficult, difficult to say. Um, and then we want to be respectful and friendly, and we want to make sure it's quick. So this circle is not something that should take up half of an instructional, you know, time period. Quick and to the point, very quick and easy. So that's the greeting focus. Um, I'm going to give you just a second to take a look at these, some examples of greetings. See if there's anything that you see on here that you would like to do or that sounds like something that you would be interested in in your setting. Anybody see anything that you think, oh, I've already done that, or I've done that in a different capacity, or that would be great to do with high school kids, not good with elementary. I 
I think a lot of high schools, even though it sounds like an elementary component, um, the spider web greeting. High school kids love the spider web greeting. You might just have a ball of yarn or you don't even have to have a ball of yarn, you can just have a ball. But you tie it like I may pass the ball to Jody, then Jody passes the ball to Ryan, then Ryan passes the ball to Lisa. So it just gets kids, you know, looking and connecting and you don't know who's going to be next. So they have to be engaged. It increases that engagement a little bit because they don't ever know when they're going to get that ball or who's going to be next. Um, and high school kids also really like the one that says, I wonder and have index cards with questions. We typically would probably think that's more elementary focused, but high school kids have a really good time with that as well. Um, it kind of gets them thinking in a different way or a different capacity. And sometimes they come up with great, great answers that you're like, wow, that was really thoughtful, you know, so. In the chat, Megan, we have, okay, that math matchup is so cute. I could make that work for my reading. So I love that, you know, seeing how to make something work for themselves. Uh, another comment, middle school students uh, love, would you rather? Yes. And then uh, another one in, uh, shared, uh, Ron said, I've done the spider web grading before in classes. That's neat. And I will also say, um, I have not put all the resources in the folder yet. So if you will check like later this afternoon, there will be some more resources in that folder and they'll have lists of some examples that you all can pull from as well. So I should have mentioned I that. I will email everyone the resource folder and make sure they have access to it and a copy of the recording too. Thank you, Mary. And then we go to the second part, which is that focusing moment. So it may be something where you're asked to follow the teacher. Um, it may be content related or it may not be content related, but oftentimes this focusing moment is just getting kids back to a regulated state after the greeting or um, focusing moments are great if you do a community building circle after recess, um, after lunch, before we go home for the day, before that chaos of the bus run, you know. So focusing moments oftentimes are just getting students to regulate and getting them focused. Um, with middle school, high school students, a lot of times I encourage if you're teaching a guided um, meditation with imagery or you're teaching about a certain breathing technique, Teach those kids why that works. Like teach them what happens when you slow down your breath. It slows down your heart rate. Then it slows down the processing of cognitive information in your brain. So teach them all those things so they understand this isn't just something crazy that Miss Martin's having us do. There's really some science behind this. And when I take those slow, deep breaths that we talk about or I've learned about, this is what happens in my brain. This is why that happens. You know, I think that will really help your kids that are older understand the importance of this. Um, here's a couple examples of the focusing moment. So I'll let you look at that just a second. Sometimes just counting is great for kids, just helping everybody take a deep breath and focus, or it can be specific ideas. If you have a school counselor, a lot of our schools have some type of school counselor who is coming in teaching specific breathing strategies, use those strategies that your students already know. Um, you know, if you've got a counselor that's teaching them about box breathing and star breathing, tie those in right here, then you as the classroom teacher don't have to come up with anything new. Then our next piece is really that connection or feeling. And again, we have to teach those emotions and those feelings. Kids oftentimes, I will call it the volcano of emotions. They have five or six emotions going on at one time and they can't identify them. And that's okay too. And kids need to know and understand that they don't necessarily always have to identify just one. So they can have multiple feelings at one time. So I think that's important. It does help with younger kids if you have some type of um, poster or you're tying it back to SEL where you say, what does your face typically look like when you're happy? Because we have some kids who are not tying that body language to feelings. So they don't see and think when they're angry that their face is red um, or when their tears well up in their eyes, that means they're angry. It doesn't mean they're sad. It means they're angry about something. So again, just teaching those things is gonna be critical with restorative practices and it ties right back to our social skills and emotional competency. Here's again, just a quick check-in. That's like what I mentioned earlier with that, how are we feeling about MTSS one through five? Kids can all hold up a finger 
and everybody do it at the same time. You can go through each student or everybody can do it at the same time. They also could do this on a Chromebook. I am not a huge fan of that because I think if we're working on relationships that we need to be talking <laughs> and leave the technology out of it. But there are some schools that do use like a check-in as soon as kids come in and it's something on a Chromebook. Um, and there is some validity to that because kids sometimes will say, I'm not feeling great today if it's virtual as opposed to saying it out loud. So we have to think about that and just consider your context. Here are some adaptations. Um, kids can always write or draw, especially if you have students um, maybe that are in an alternative education setting. If you have students that um, you're working with that are in a resource room of some nature, you know, those are perfectly fine as well. We still would go through the same process. It might just be a quick drawing, a 30 to 60 second drawing, as opposed to talking or verbalizing. Um, that is perfectly fine as well. Choosing colors, a lot of kids um, equate emotions to color. So what's your color today? You know, are you black? Are you yellow and happy? Are you, that's okay too. Um, whatever works for you in your setting and in your context with your students. Another thing that is really important for these connections is there are a lot of teachers who have a specific greeting for kids. Um, it may be that each individual kid has a greeting or when I go to math, I know that my greeting is this specific handshake or this specific high five, and that's okay too. That would fit right here with this connection and check-in. So I know that such and such teacher does this every time. The one word check-in, that is fine. A theatrical check-in takes a little bit longer. So if you're worried about time and you want to get through this, I would, I would have you kind of stay away from that theatrical check-in or the movie check-in. It feels a little bit like you're playing charades when you do that, but it does work with kids. Um, so if you find yourself having a little extra time, you might want to try that. The one word is pretty quick and easy. So the circle activity, oftentimes, remember, this is the one that I said, when you're doing community building, if you're going to leave something out, leave the activity out. The activity is really important when you think about a restorative circle. So if something has happened in the classroom that you as the teacher are not okay with and you move to a circle, that's when the conversation would occur about the behavior. So this says it takes up the bulk of the circle time and we have a little bit different purpose if we're talking about a restorative circle within a classroom. We really are thinking about problem solving a classroom issue. So why are we using inappropriate names to talk to each other? Um, do we need to go back and review school-wide expectations, which are be responsible, be respectful, because we're having a lot of disrespectful behavior in the classroom? Do we need to talk about procedures because kids seem to have forgotten what the classroom procedures are? This also is where you could teach a social skill. So right here, you see that fourth or fifth bullet down, it says teach social skills. That is perfectly fine for an activity. So you can tie that into your SEL time. And then you can also build the community. So this is the, the activity, which is the third component of a circle, is really important if you are talking about a restorative piece, if something is going on in the classroom that you are trying to correct, all right? So that's the important circle. And then the closing, it could be a signal, um, it could be a reflection, it could be an example of like a one word, two word checkout, it could be a song, a chant, a classroom, applause, something really quick and easy. But it's a way to say we all agree and we all are on the same page that our circle time is over. We're moving now to academic content or we're moving now to something else. So your closing is important so that students understand that circle has been completed. We're finished with it. So that really takes us through the four components of a circle. There are some fidelity checks for classroom circles. So here's an example of one. If you are in a place where your school is ready to implement circles, I will put some of those fidelity checks, quick monitoring pieces in that um, resource folder that they're in there and you can take a look at. So as an administrator, um, or if you're, if you're observing another teacher, these are the things that you would be looking for. And if somebody's gonna come into my classroom and do a fidelity check, it might not be for any specific data. It may just be to help me as a teacher implement circles better. So it might just be that I need my principal to come in. I think I'm doing them well, but I want you to watch one and see if I'm missing anything. So it can just be for some general feedback as well. 
So we're moving now really to our last piece, which is that restorative discipline. So this is more for administrators, but teachers have to understand this. So when we think about keys to trauma-informed discipline, we really want to make sure we're reducing any you know, escalation that has occurred. We're either de-escalating or we're preventing future escalation. We also want to make sure that discipline practices are embedded into a PBI system that's appropriate, and we want to avoid re-traumatization for any student when we think about trauma. So those are really key pieces of restorative discipline. And then when we think about restorative discipline, we go back to those four R's. And any of you all that are trauma trainers or have been through CTAX trauma training or anybody else's really, you know what these four R's are. So for our staff in schools, these are critical. We want to realize that the challenging behavior may be a result of something that has happened to the student and not necessarily blame them for it. We want to recognize what those signs and symptoms of traumatic stress look like in the classroom. So what does each individual student, what does their behavior look like as they are beginning to escalate, as they start getting those triggers that are affecting them? What might that look like in classrooms? And then we want to respond. And so we think about responding to students. I love the what's in quotations. It says connect, then redirect. Oftentimes, adults in schools, in classrooms, we try to redirect before we've ever connected with the student. So the student is disconnected from our classroom. They're disconnected from us as the adult in charge of the learning environment. And so it doesn't matter how many times we say to them, I need you to calm down. They're not going to calm down if they don't feel connected to us. Or my favorite is, you know, when a student has thrown a chair across the classroom and we have an adult that they're not connected to and they don't have a good relationship, look at them and say, you need to breathe. I need you to breathe, right? Well, that kid's never going to breathe for that adult that hasn't ever connected with them. So that connect then redirect is so important because we cannot redirect kids if we don't have that relationship and that connection with them. And then oftentimes that connect before redirect, it may mean that we get down on the same eye level with them. It may mean that we sit in the corner with them. It may mean that other students leave the room and we just sit in silence, but we have to learn to connect with kids before we're ever going to be able to redirect them and de-escalate oftentimes. So I love the respond part, that connect and redirect. And then we have to think about what does this student need? So how can I resist the re-traumatization? What does that look like? And it may look different for every student. Do they need to be in a quiet location for a little while? Is there a trigger in the classroom that I can remove? Is it a scent? Is it a a noise, I don't know, you know, thinking about that. What was the trigger and how can I avoid that trigger in the future? So when we think about trauma-informed discipline, are we understanding and utilizing the four R's is going to be really important. And if we are using all those as the administrator, what happens then when I have to step in? So we want to de-escalate the student, but what happens when the administrator has to step in because no one else is able to calm the student, no one else is able to redirect, or they continue to escalate. So allowing the student to self-regulate and calm their brain and body is critical. That can, again, look different for every student. If you have those positive relationships with your students, you know what each kid needs. You know if student A likes to go outside and take a walk, and you know if student B just likes to sit in a chair in the corner and be quiet for five minutes as we set a timer. So you really need those positive relationships to know what the best thing is for each kiddo. Create a minute of calm. You know, oftentimes when students are escalated or we send them to an administrator, they close the door and immediately they feel attached. Like what's going on? What happened in that classroom? Tell me what happened. What did you do? And oftentimes we have a teacher there saying, well, Miss Belcher, he did this and then he did this and then he did this. Guess what? That kid knows exactly what he did. He's already lived it once in that classroom. He doesn't need to hear that teacher <laughs> relive that for him. So those conversations need to take place without that student hearing them, number one. But it may not be the appropriate time for that conversation because not only is the student escalated, but oftentimes the adult is still escalated as well. So we have to consider that. As the administrator, you can say, listen, Johnny, I know you're really struggling and you've had some things go on in the classroom this morning. I have to respond to these emails, whether you have to or not, tell them you do. I have to respond to these emails. 
So I'm just going to let you sit there for a few minutes. Let me work on this. And then we'll talk in a minute. You're allowing that kiddo some time in quiet to just calm down and breathe. And they don't know. They think you're really doing something really critical for your whatever. Um, but things like that are going to be important and knowing those kids. You may want to have just a collection or some tools on your desk. Do they need a stress ball? Do you want to draw for a minute? You know, is there anything that would help you calm down if you know the students well? And oftentimes our high flyers, we know them really well. We know that Bronna likes a stress ball. We know that Bernadette likes to draw. And we know that Mary just likes to sit in the corner and breathe. So, you know, we know those kids that are frequent flyers and we know what each of them needs once they get to us. Sometimes we can ask the student to, to take a couple breaths or we can breathe with them. We can take a walk with them. It doesn't have to be in a principal's office. You know, we can have those conversations outside as we walk around the track one time because we know that this kid will de-escalate a little bit quicker if we're outside or whatever that looks like. Um, we do know that sensory plays a big part in de-escalation and calming students down. Um, so I've got some ice in here. Do you want to get a piece of ice out of the freezer? Do you want a cold drink of water? You know, what are some things that may help this student de-escalate? And oftentimes those are tied to some type of sensory piece um, and temperature and cold being something that we know regulates our bodies rather quickly. Some kids I've had in the past, they don't want to eat ice. They just want to hold it. You know, I just want to hold a piece of ice. All right, let's get you a piece of ice. If that's all it takes for a student to de-escalate, we can make that happen pretty quickly. And then want to make sure that these kids that are frequent flyers, we have some type of positive relationship with them before they're sitting in our office and we're giving them a consequence. So you may not have a positive relationship the first time you see them in your office, but by the third time, we hope that you've connected with that student in a more positive environment at some point in a classroom, in a cafeteria, on a ball field, you know, before they're back in your office as a high flyer. So some things that we want to ask ourselves as administrators, and this with restorative practices is really important. Does the student trust me? So we want to build trust with our students, just like we want to build trust with staff members. And the answer may not always be yes. So this kid may not trust me, but what can I do as the administrator to continue to build that trust? You also have to think, does this student feel psychologically and physically safe sitting here right now? If we have a teacher reliving the behavior that happened in the classroom or the cafeteria, the kid probably doesn't feel safe right there. So maybe you could step outside the door. Come on, Miss Smith, let's go outside in the hallway and you can share what you need to with me. At least they're not right there with the student. So how can we create a feeling of safety for them? Am I calm as the adult or other adults that are involved in the conversation calm? And as the administrator, our principals need to understand they're in control of that. You know, if there's an adult that's escalated, they can pause that conversation. They can ask that escalated adult to step outside or talk to them separately. They're in charge of those conversations. And I think sometimes our administrators struggle with that. And do we have a process for this? If we have a process that is restorative instead of punitive, then it's not that I, as Ms. Martin, am giving you a consequence. I'm pulling up my consequence chart and I'm saying, okay, J. Tavius, this was your behavior. So I want you to look at where this falls on the matrix. So here are the things that could happen as a result of your behavior. So we really are going back to, we have a system in place that is trauma informed and is restorative. So again, the only thing on there should not be in school, out of school suspension. There are other things that we have that are options for us. So that's really important too. So this section really is for our administrators, but I do think that it's important that we think about these things and making sure if we're going to implement this in our district, do we have administrators who are going to buy into this and are going to be able to do this? Do we have administrators who are going to be able to handle the restorative discipline component of restorative practices? So again, giving students choices is always helping them feel safe and helping them feel empowered. Um, you know, do you want to talk with the door open or closed? Is it too hot in here? Do you want me to turn the air down? You want to sit in here in the office or you want to take a walk down the hallway and talk about this? Where do you want to sit? It can be something as simple as, listen, I've got three chairs over there. Pick which chair you want to sit in and then we'll talk. You know, so that student, to us, that's no shouldn't be a big deal as to which chair they sit in. But to that student, that may feel like that's the first choice they've had in this entire situation that's occurring. 
Another thing that's oftentimes part of a restorative circle or part of restorative discipline is asking that student, you know, I know that you and Ms. Belcher um, have a really good relationship and I know that you work with her in Success Academy. Would you feel more comfortable if I called Ms. Belcher to see if she could have this conversation with us? So allowing that student to have some trusted adult with them, that oftentimes helps as well. Here are our seven questions that we say are tied to restorative practices and changing school discipline. So I want you to read these questions and just think about how we typically talk to students when they're in a principal's office or um, in some type of setting where they've done something wrong and think about how these sound different. So just take a minute and look at these and then let's talk about how these sound different from a typical conversation in a principal's office. So let's talk a little bit about how these questions, these seven questions sound different and what's different about them than what we typically hear when a student is in trouble for behavior in a principal's office. What do you notice? Anybody can unmute and share. Let's just have have a quick conversation. What do you notice? This is a lot of asking instead of telling. Like instead of and instead of saying you did this and you did this and now we're gonna you know this is what's gonna happen. The the, the student has a voice. So it gives the student some voice. Um, In and the it's chat. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, man. It gives. It gives them in the chat, it says it gives them the uh, the opportunity to reflect, explain, have a voice, creates a conversation. So I think, uh, yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, when I think about when I was sitting in that seat and the way that I talked to kids probably was different than a lot of principals because I was a counselor, right? So when you think about that, I think that you, your approach to talking to students is oftentimes different if you have a counseling background as opposed to not. But I still think that, Asking them the questions um, is just a great way for them to be able to share with you their perspective, because so many times we get the perspective of the teacher, whether it's from the office referral, whether it's from them telling us, but the student oftentimes does not feel like their perspective matters, or if they share their perspective that some adults going to go, no, that's not, that's not what happened, right? And we know that kids' perspective of situations is very different than the adults that are involved oftentimes and other kids that are involved. It's different from other students as well. So I really like that we're getting the kids' perspective because sometimes they share something during these questions that we may never have known if we had been the ones telling them instead of asking them. So that's one of the pieces I like. What else do you all notice? Or what do you wonder? What are questions you have after looking at these questions? I think the one thing that oftentimes we say is like the question that says who else was affected, we tell them who else was affected instead of making them think about it. Instead of them thinking how, who did this affect and how did it affect, we tell them, you know, you, you disrupted class for all these other kids or instead of asking them. The other question that I think is critical is how were you affected by this? So oftentimes we tell them but they don't have to think and reflect, well, because of this behavior, now I'm not going to get to X, Y, and Z, you know, whatever it is. But they need to think about that and reflect on it because kids struggle with that oftentimes, that reflection of how does this affect me? 
Anything else? Anything else you noticed about it? It focuses on the individual and not the situation or the incident. It does, yes. And the two questions that are kind of on that third row down there, one says, what do you need to do to make this right? And what can you do to repair the harm? So I think that's a very different way to talk to kids and to ask those questions instead of saying, so now you're going to be in in-school suspension the rest of the day and, you know, blah, 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 blah. We're saying to them, what do you need to do to fix this? Because sometimes these kids come up with things that we as the adults would never have thought of. Any other thoughts on these questions that change student discipline? Do you see yourself being able to use these? Do you see your principals in your district being able to use these? Last year um, with our, the Center for School Safety, as you all know, is part of our um, School Safety and Resiliency Act. Every school district has to identify a safe schools coordinator. And so one of the things that um, John Akers asked us to do last year was to, we created just like a one page trauma informed discipline questions um, for principals just to kind of put on their desk. This, you know, this is just a reference sheet, something to help me remember. And it has these questions, you know, these are the questions and the order that you could ask these questions in. And so I'll drop that in the folder as well from the Center for School Safety, but just kind of helping administrators remember, because when there's been a serious situation, these questions are not going to be our first go to, you know, we're going to have to be reminded what these questions are, how to ask them, because it's not going to be natural for most of us, right? Any other thoughts on the questions, the trauma-informed discipline questions that are tied back to restorative practices? Okay. So I really think that we've been through our three practices. So we've talked about effective statements. We've talked about our community building circles as well as restorative circles. And then we've talked about our restorative discipline practices. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a second. And I want us to kind of go back to what we started with earlier this morning. How do you see this working in your district? Is this something that you think you're ready for? Are there other pieces that you think may need to be put in place first? So I really want you all to be able to ask some questions. Um, if you have any questions, we can address them now. We can talk through things. Or I want you to be thinking about is this going to work for me? How is it going to work? What's it going to look like? Um, I think that those questions have to be answered before we can even begin to think about what would be my timeline or where do I start? You know, so go ahead and anybody who has questions, you can drop them in the chat. You can just unmute. And we'll just talk through some of these questions, especially since we're just such a small group. Normally, I would put you all in some rooms and have you all have conversation, but there's not enough of us to do that. So let's just talk through some of these pieces. So Megan, I have a, a question. I've, I've been thinking about one particular student. He was a sixth grader, so he's going to be in seventh grade. He is, um, I don't, I think if breathing wasn't automatic, he wouldn't do it. Um, and so I, we've tried multiple different things with him, you know, letting him um, kind of help our custodians. Um, letting him help us at lunch. I mean, just different things, but he is still in that process of in the classroom, not wanting to do anything. Um, and there's a lot of home issues. We know that. Um, so I'm just wondering, I know for sure we're going to have to start with the effective statements. And I've already thought about how I can model that for our teachers, especially the ones that I think are going to have issues buying into this. But I definitely want to do this because Anytime I've seen a student in my office, I immediately go, listen, I don't want to suspend you because you need to be here. Um, sometimes that's, you know, not an option, of course, but, you know, I'm just trying to think of the kids that, like this one particular one, how do I, you know, because I thought we had a good relationship, um, you know, I knew things about him, he knew things about me, um, you know, he's very likable, but just kind of do-less. So my first thought is, let's go back to the function of that behavior. So you can have a great relationship, very positive relationship with students, but if they're struggling with your academic content or 
they don't want to be there, they're still going to present those behaviors in classroom settings. So I think we have to go back to, is he presenting the behavior in all settings or is it at specific classrooms? And then what's he, what's he trying to get out of that behavior? What does he want? Um, and one of the things that we see a lot is students may have a very positive relationship with an administrator, with a counselor, and sometimes that behavior is presented in classrooms so that they can get to that person <laughs> that they have that positive relationship with, right? Because that's where I feel the most comfortable at school is with Miss Carpenter because she's my principal and she understands and she knows what's going on with me and that teacher doesn't. So I think we have to there, you know, with kids that are struggling like that, go back to that function of behavior and determine what that function of behavior is before we can come up with a plan. The other thing with a kid like that is you can start with individual kids with effective statements before you start school wide. So, you know, you may be able to model and talk to him about effective statements when you have him, when you're in his when he's in your office or as an intervention. You know, you can talk with him about identifying feelings as a tier two intervention and how to use effective statements and get some of those students who are more challenging to start thinking about those things and start talking about those things. And those kids will really help you gain insight on what other students in your school might say to be prepared for. So that right. would be what I would say to maybe start with a kid like that. And Brana and Bernadette, y'all may have jump in anytime. Y'all have a world of knowledge too. Something that I did that I found very effective with students because I am a firm believer that kids need to be in the classroom instead of, you know, getting the call, this kid's doing X, Y, Z, come get him. I would just push in. I would pull a chair up next to the kid at their desk. I mean, unless it's completely explosive, you know, and just say, hey, I'm here to help. Let me support you in, in getting this done. What, what, what can I help you with? you've got, you've got my next 20 minutes or whatever. And just, and, and two, for teachers in my building who were button pushers as well, uh, it let them know, I'm not letting either of you out of this. <laughs> you know, I, this is where we have to work. This is where we have to get along. And this is both, a, this is everybody's job. And so we're going to, we're going to be right here in this classroom together and we're going to work it out. And that was, uh, that was very effective. That's a great point, Lisa. And the other thing, you know, is these students who may be your frequent flyers, is there an intervention in place? You know, you have to think about that as well, because oftentimes um, in some of, some of our schools right now, we have interventions in place, but if teachers are not implementing those interventions as they were designed, they're never going to work. So, you know, we have to consider that piece too. Do we have an intervention in place and the teacher is not doing it correctly? And that's why the student's not successful. So, you know, you have to think about it from several different perspectives and lenses, I think. So that was a great Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Asking, hey, where's the plan and are you following the plan? And can I see your data? Can I see your, your monitoring data? Uh, sometimes it just, we just have to kind of refocus and get back, get back to the plan. Absolutely. There's, you know, and something even as simple as check in, check out. I heard a kid this year at some point, you know, look at a principal and the principal said, let's look at your check in, check out data in this specific classroom. And I think it was math, you know, and I think the principal was thinking he really just struggles with math and he doesn't want to be in math. And immediately when she asked him that question, he said, well, there isn't any data because that teacher won't ever fill out my check in, check out monitoring sheets. So when the Seventh grade kid can tell you that there's not any data, that's a red flag, right? So that's an adult issue that we have to handle a little bit differently than with that individual kid. So yeah, those are great points. So what are you all thinking? What are some of the places that you think you might start? Do you think, okay, we definitely are ready for this? Is anybody thinking, mm, this might be a little bit more than I was thinking restorative practices is? Kind of where, where is everybody right now with the implementation, I guess? I have a question. Um, we had a student at one point, I had a student in class that was throwing chairs, breaking pencils, hitting kids, throwing books, yada, yada. And he really liked me. I mean, it wasn't that I didn't have a relationship with him because I did. But someone came up with a plan 
that if he could go 15 minutes without getting so many, and I have the data to back, to back it up. He had the data. If he could go 15 minutes without getting, um, I think it was 10 X's, um, whereas breaking pencils would have been an X, throwing them at a student would have been an X, flipping a chair would have been an X. If he could have got, if he got less than 10, then he got 10 minutes of free iPad time. He would get nine. He would go to nine every time because nine meant he still got the iPad time. And what happened by the end of the year was I had a class full of kids who were all wanting free iPad time because the ones that were working, that's my question to you. Where do you go with that kind of kid? Because he knew his boundaries. He knew how far he could go and still get what he wanted. So where do you go with that? And then we had another, we have another student that it doesn't matter what you say to him or a kid says to him, he screams in your face. How do you even get that kid to talk to you when all they do is scream? So a couple of different thoughts. You know, when we think about restorative practices, we're definitely going to start with tier one. We're definitely going to start with here's what we're going to do school wide for all students. If you have students who are already exhibiting, um, you know, very inappropriate behaviors or who are already receiving interventions, tier one is, we know is not going to be enough for them, but they still have to get that instruction. So we're always going to start with tier one and layering that foundation before we go to anything responsive. Um, and then I would go back to, you know, some of the pieces that you talked about that intervention. So with interventions, students should always earn positives, but it sounds like if we're giving X's, that's a very negative connotation to behavior so instead of giving x well actually they were check marks not x's i said x's but they were check marks because he was not doing too many so <laughs> yeah i think we want to flip that you know flip kind of that language to what do we want the student to do and when you do this you earn your check mark you know or whatever that may look like so i think you want to make sure that your interventions are focused on the positive number one and then the intervention goal should be changing as student behavior improves so if it was that he we wanted him to get eight out of ten check marks in a certain amount of time then once he is consistently receiving that eight out of ten we move that into nine and then we move it into 10. And so I think that's really important is that we don't keep that intervention that is stagnant in place because the purpose is that this intervention, we want to fade. You know, we want to remove the intervention once it is working and the student learns the appropriate social skills. Um, so I think that's really important to think about as well and giving a timeline. So then my question would be, did you go back to those individual student intervention meetings? You know. Were you looking at accurate data? Did you have decision rules in place? So that's kind of the first thought with that. And then I think the second part of your question was, what do we do when students, other students are saying, well, we want to earn that time too. And so that's very individualized to each district or school as to how you all handle that. Um, if students, if we have PBIS in place and it's effective, students should already be in a place where all students are able to earn something. We think about those four levels of acknowledgement that go with PBIS. Um, you know, so level one is that verbal, nonverbal. Then level two is more that uh, public acknowledgement. Level three is access to privilege. And level four is something tangible or token. So we want to think about, do we have a PBIS system in place and an acknowledgement system within PBIS that's working for our kids? So it might be that you need to go back to that tier one acknowledgement piece and adjust some things going on there. That's That would be my first suggestion. Well, this was just two separate students over several years. For the main part, it's working. I was just talking about two kids that it just nothing we did was working. That's what I was trying to get to, I guess, is that we couldn't get to those kids. I just think it was a lot deeper. There was a lot of deeper issues than what just sure. yeah so I think once you know that your tier one system is in place and it's working effectively then you go to your interventions and so you know we know with the continuum of interventions thinking about a three-tiered model that it may get to tier three where we need wraparound services and supports we may need outside agencies to come in um, you know, like if it is a deeper issue and maybe it's something connected to mental health or something outside of the school setting, then we want to make sure that we have appropriate 
wraparound services in place. And I don't even know what district you're in, but thinking about, you know, what does that look like for each of you all is going to look a little bit different too. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Well, and I will say this too, Megan, uh, what gets monitored gets done. So if you're monitoring and attending and giving check marks for negative behavior, that's going to continue. Whereas if you flip that and the, you're giving the, the, the reward or the attention to the correct behavior, that's going to get attended, that's going to get done more. Does that make sense? Yes. I think that's left up to the person that's actually writing the behavior plans, the plan, not really the teacher that's doing it because we just, you know, they were just doing what was told. It was the plan itself, the way the plan was written. And it may go back to Denise, it may be that whoever's writing that plan, maybe they need some professional, you know, development and professional learning around those intervention plans or whatever that looks like. But yes, I totally understand what you're saying is the teacher was just trying to implement what was provided, right? Yeah, I agree. And I kept trying to say this plan isn't working, yeah. but yeah. I was just the teacher, but you're well, exactly I right. Good comment in the chat, but become a team, you know. It, team working together sure. yeah and so you know if you have an effective system it's not just left up to one person to write that intervention plan or decide the intervention it's a team of people looking at data um, and really determining what that team feels like will work and what will not work and then putting something in place so yeah a lot of different a lot of different moving parts there so what about restorative practices? Let's just do a quick check in with everybody and kind of see where are you? Do you have more questions and answers after this morning? Are you in a place where you go, OK, I'm going to you know, need to do a little bit more research and decide how we're going to move forward? What's everybody thinking with that? I see um, Jody and Lisa, I know you're both Menifee County. Any thoughts from you all for kind of what you all are thinking right now in your district? I think for us, we just need, I think we have people who are willing and want to do it and we have some things in place. I think it's just the, not retraining almost, but almost like refre just a refresher more than sure. anything else. So uh, Jody, what do you, do you agree with that? Or what are you seeing uh, when you are at Central? I do, I agree. I mean, in the last two years we've had, um, well, you've merged the two schools, Megan. So we have new leadership and then we've had 19 new teachers in our new teacher cadre the last two years in a row. So for a small district, you've lost, you know, quite a bit of that capacity. I think we built up pre COVID. And so it's, it's just reintroducing, reemphasizing. And I think being consistent, what Lisa said about what's monitored is done. And sure. so I can't say that there's a lot of monitoring in place for our PBIS and, and restorative practices though. But it's it's definitely modeled. I think we've we've modeled these reflection circles for three or four years now. Okay. And I think, you know, one of the pieces that I'll add, Jody and Lisa, is that I know Tanya and Mr. Spencer kind of talked about you all as a district may be in a place where you kind of need some foundational PBIS professional learning for those new teachers, the new staff that are coming in because you have so many of them. So it's hard to sustain your systems when you have a high rate of turnover. So, you know, you have to think about those things as well. And I know that's something you all are already talking about, but if you're in another district, that might be something to think about too, is do we have enough capacity within our staff right now and who we have? You know, we, we don't want to throw a new um, initiative on where we don't have capacity on existing initiatives, you know, just something to think about. Anybody else? So Mary and Bernadette and Brana, any questions you all feel like we need to address or anything you all want to add kind of around the conversation? I think you've done a wonderful job with it, Megan. Um, I can't really think of anything to add at this point, but I, I think you've covered it all well. Well, I think restorative practices um, as a whole, sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around. You mm -hmm. know, you have to think about it there's is. so many pieces mm -hmm. and then each of the practices has different components within the practice. 
Um, so it's not just a quick and easy, like we can do That's a one right. hour training for restorative practices and think we're going to implement it. It is an initiative. It is something to think about, you know, as far as a timeline and when we're going to train and when we're going to implement and who we're going to train. So I think those are all questions that are good for you guys to be thinking about if you want to do this, what that's going to look like in practice. I'll agree with you. It takes time. And if you don't have it laid out specifically in a timeline, we all get busy and it gets left behind. So I think that is key right there is to thinking it through and realizing also that it's not going to happen tomorrow, that it's a process, you know. And also tying it to existing pieces. How does it tie to what we have currently? Yep. Exactly. Super important. I love that trying to connect it and make it make it blend with what we are doing so it doesn't feel so much like an additional but thing being added onto that plate. Uh, you've done a wonderful job, Megan. My only question would be what where would we need to go next with restorative practices? Like as you know, at, for Quebec as for additional support, those types of things, what what would be next? You know, uh, being able to uh, have another meeting is, is there a need for another meeting for another level of looking sure. at restorative practices well it may be that we um mary we can work together and maybe send the participants from today a survey um and just ask you know kind of where you are after you all have had time to process it and um meredith i so appreciate that you are still on it's the end of our session and you um i hope you're out of your uber by now but <laughs> Uh, you know, that shows the um, the desire to implement restorative practices when you've been in an Uber, you're sitting at the airport, you've already been through TSA, it looks like. So, I mean, you have hung in there. So I think just sending a survey out to our participants from today and asking what your all's needs are, is it something that you feel like, you know, you would benefit from additional, we could do trainings, we can do leads, we could do, you know, virtual, in person. So I think we can talk through that and kind of ask you guys, you know, what are your all's needs? And then we can respond to the needs um, of the region and be able to support you all. And however, however you all feel like would be best for each of your districts or schools um, and go from there. I think that's probably our next step. On our feedback survey, that is like the last question that we're going to give today. So, it, but like you said, they may not know right now. So if whatever they fill in, we can come, they can always reach out to us. Uh, we have a couple more things in the chat and Angel said, I've started circles with my drama students, not acting drama, but drama, drama. <laughs> and then we have, I think this is great. I would love to see the entire district to get on board it is going to take time and people who are committed. And then Meredith says, I'm super passionate about it, it changes the world. So that, that's wonderful in practice there. And so uh, there, sure. that's all the comments in the chat. So if you all have, um, I know you're going to complete the survey. So Mary, you can go ahead and do whatever you need with that. But if you all have specific questions, you can reach out to the KVEC team and then they will share those with us and we can maybe do a FAQ document or something of that nature to help um, answer some of the questions and then let you all know what next steps are. So 